Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon to um, this is our second salon of the afternoon. Um, if you came and joined us for the first. Uh, we are thrilled to uh, welcome everyone here today. This is our inaugural day for the triennial um, focused on nature. So um, we just opened um, this morning with the exhibition to the public. I am one of the co-curators. My name is Andrea Lips. I'm an associate curator of contemporary design. Um, and one of the things we really wanted to do with you this afternoon is really celebrate a lot of the work um, that is on view in our galleries by inviting our designers here to explore some of the themes and ideas um, that are on view upstairs. So uh, the one thing I really wanted to do today was to explore ideas around growth and encouraging growth and looking at biology um, at very disparate scales. Um, and so I am joined today by uh, three quite incredible designers. So um, Amy Congdon, um, whose presentation will be first. And Amy is a designer, a researcher, and a critical thinker who explores the boundaries between design, science, and technology. And even though her formal training is in textiles, um, she actually has um, almost a decade of hands-on lab ex expertise. Um, she's been working with the tissue engineering and biophotonics department at King's College London. Did I get that right? All right, pretty good. Uh, it is. Um, and at Symbiotica, which is at the University of Western Australia. Um, and so she is joined then by Marcus Cruz, who is an architect and professor of innovative environments at the Bartlett School of Architecture. And he's the director of BioID, which is a cross-disciplinary research platform between architecture and biochemical engineering, which focuses on new um, forms of bio integrated design, and I like that idea of bio-integration. Um, and then Richard Beckett um, will be joining us with a presentation. He is an architect and designer from London and is a lecturer in bio-augmented design at the Bartlett School of Architecture. And again, bio-augmented design. I just, I like this bio-integration, bio-augmentation um, is really interesting how, you know, we keep kind of you know, thinking of ways to infuse biology um, and design. So uh, Richard, I think, very interestingly studied physiology and biochemistry and worked as a physical properties scientist before studying architecture. Um, and his current research explores how living forms are integrated in our contemporary built environment. So with that, um, welcome. Uh, we are first going to hear from uh, each of our speakers. They're gonna give very brief presentations and then we're gonna um, come up on stage and have a bit of a conversation and then open it up for questions to all of you. So, Amy, I would like to welcome you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Andrea, and uh, thank you so much for everyone uh, for coming. Um, as the slide says, my name's Amy Congdon. Um, and as Andrea mentioned, I am a textile designer by training, and when I tell most people that, they go, oh, great, you make cushions. Um, which is not exactly what I do, but is uh, you know uh, one of the things I've been asked usually in the back of taxi cabs. Um, <laughs> but um, I, so when I learnt and I trained as a textile designer, this was sort of the environment that I was based in. I learnt to knit, weave, sew, print, dye textiles, all of the things that you would do um, in that kind of environment. Um, but then over the last eight years or so, I found myself in places like this which is very different to what I was used to. Scientific laboratories, this is actually an image of the tissue engineering and biophotonics department at King's College London, which is based at Guy's Hospital, um, <laughs> where I've been doing work for my PhD, which is, looking, which is called tissue engineered textiles, so bringing traditional textile techniques and combining them with tissue engineering. But I suppose the question that a lot of people ask when I pull up something like this is how did you get to doing this and how did a textile designer end up working with tissue engineers and I have a very specific moment that I can trace back to where my interest came from and actually it's really lovely to be here today because it's actually all of this museum's fault um, <laughs> it was a show called extreme textiles and one of the pieces the uh, image on the right is of something called nicknamed the beautiful snowflake which is a digitally embroidered medical implant for someone, a patient who needed reconstructive surgery in his shoulder. So the reason, the, what the surgeon wanted was lots of different attachment points to sew the muscle back in place. 
Um, now, the reason that embroidery was used is you can mimic natural structures in the body. With something like a weave, it's at right angles, and if you cut it, it frays. A knit will unravel if you've ever got hold of a sweater and started trying to <laughs> pull it apart. You know how that ends, um, and it's very stretchy. So I was fascinated by the way that textiles was being used in sort of cutting-edge science, but millennia-old millennia techniques, you know, a running stitch or a satin stitch, were being used to help repair the body. So I began researching um, and working in the field of tissue engineering. So tissue engineering really is a field that is involved in trying to repair the body. So using cells and scaffolds to try and grow replacement parts. That can be anything from tissue and skin all the way to people who are looking to try and replace whole organs. It's still very much an experimental science, but it's very multidisciplinary, which is why I love it. Um, and my work has been exploring how you can use different materials and traditional textile techniques to create scaffolds for cells. So scaffold very much like scaffolding of a building that you can put cells onto and help control the, the way they grow and how they orient themselves. So what you're seeing uh, in this image here, um, so much of my work is looking down a microscope to see how things are going. Um, a lot of it's very weird to suddenly work with things that you can't necessarily see with the naked eye. Um, but this is a three-stranded plait. So the way you, you might plait your hair or um, and then on top of it are muscle cells, and they're the bright red things that you can see on there, and they're sort of individual fibers that are coming off um, from the plait. So, because I'm saying so much of the work that I do is down, you look down a microscope to see how it's going. Um, I also have worked with an illustrator to show what was happening to help sort of explain some of that. So you can see in this illustration, you can see the textile structure on the left, the cells on their own in the middle, and then the two combined on the right-hand image. And what you can see are the cells actually attaching to the individual fibers that make up the thread that are then plaited into the scaffold. Um, so by doing that, what, you, what I found is that you can, if you understand how to construct a textile structure, you can then start to have control over how the cells orient and how they grow. So with a muscle cell, you want them to align in a certain way, so you'd make a certain type of structure. Um, so it's really interesting how you can bring that textile knowledge into something like the science of tissue engineering. And you can also even control where they don't grow. So I've been fascinated by bringing in ideas of things like resist dyeing, where you will put different things on a textile to stop a dye taking in certain areas. You can also make structures where you have some materials where cells love to grow and some where they won't grow. So you're controlling where you get growth and where you don't. But next, um, I wanted to quickly touch um, sort of on the context and the development of the work in nature, which has been part of this sort of, uh, ongoing area of research for me. Um, and it's looking at different types of scaffolds. So um, one of the processes that comes from tissue engineering that I've been fascinated with is called decellularization. Um, and this is where you take a biological structure, so it can be anything from an organ to a leaf, like you see here, um, and you remove the cells so that all you're left with is the architecture or the scaffold uh, of, that, of that piece. So, for example, in a leaf, it will be something like the cellulose is left behind. And that's been used in regenerative medicine to create biologically compatible scaffolds um, for organ repair. Um, above this, this is a, an image of a spinach leaf. So you can see it at the beginning on the left-hand side. When it's, things are decellularized, they usually use, lose most of their color. They become translucent. They're doing it with hearts. There's a, if you Google ghost heart, there's lots of beautiful images of like translucent hearts that are being used and researched so that if you could see the patient's own cells, hopefully you get a lack of a chance of rejection. That's definitely still in development, but this is sort of how it's being used for repairing the body. And then the image on the right-hand side is of um, heart cells, which have actually been shown to beat uh, when they've been seeded onto, uh, onto the leaf, because you can also use the vasculature of the leaf to transport nutrients and things like that. So it's fascinating using sort of traditional structures that you find in nature for sort of new applications. Um, so a lot of my work has sort of straddled uh, developing techniques or knowledge that could feed both into regenerative medicine, but also future design applications. So I was interested in exploring this technique for a different purpose, that of haute couture or sort of high fashion. So I've, for the work in the nature show, I've been decelerizing red rose petals. So the image on the top left. The bottom of the on left is a decellularized red rose petal. So it's had all of its cells removed. Um, and then I've been 
experimenting with seeding skin cells, uh, so actually the skin cells I've been working with are cow skin cells, uh, onto that as a scaffold. Um, and then here's a microscopic image um, of a decellarized rose petal, and you can see the sort of ghostly, sort of almost sort of round or like hexagon shapes that are faint in the background. Those are the plant cell walls that are left over after the process. Um, there's a vein running through it, which is sort of from the structure of the petal itself. And then all of the bright spots are skin cells, which are actually tracking the outside or the, the cell walls, which is really fascinating. Um, when you look down a microscope, it's like when you see something in real life and then you take a picture, it's never quite the same. Uh, this one looks uh, very much like a sort of a city with lots of lights shining when you look down the microscope. It's really beautiful. So all of this research uh, fed into the work that's on display upstairs, which is designed to be a haute couture atelier workbench um, with an embroidery partially completed, a worksheet showing cells where I've grown different, different cells on different materials, everything from freshwater pearls to Swarovski crystals, as well as the petals, and then bespokely designed tools and petri dishes to enable the creation of new materials and processes. So talking about the idea of encouraging growth, I know there's a very good reason why petri dishes are round, but if I was gonna grow a rose petal, I'd like the dishes to be shaped in the size that I needed. Um, so that was a very quick whistle stop to <laughs> through some of my work, but hopefully get to talk some more about it through the panel, but thank you. So. Thank you for the introduction as well, and thank you for inviting us. Um, so, bio-integrated design. Oh, there's, there's sound that needs to be lower. Can actually, can you give me a second? Can we control, can we control the sound and make it? Um, hmm? It could be, but very, very, very minor, the sound of the video. Is that possible? Good. So bio-integrated design is this research platform that um, is um, existing between architecture and um, uh, biochemical engineering. So I, I created this with um, a colleague of mine, Brenda Parker, not so long time ago at UCL. And what we have there is um, two-year master's students um, in, or in the two-year master's course, doctoral studies, and also um, uh, externally funded research. So um, this is only a very quick snapshot of a few uh, projects and themes that interest us. Um, the thing with design and new materials is that we want to apply them to the future built environment. The problem really is the, 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 the built environment is terribly unsustainable, as you all know, and we are looking for new ways of, of working from a very small scale to a bigger scale. Bioprinting is a very important area um, where we use robotic tools to extrude with a high level accuracy and definition a variety of viscous materials. So in this case, hydrogels with encapsulated algae uh, that is photosynthetic while being immobilized in the medium. Uh, hydrogels enable us to retain huge amounts of water, which is a great advantage so they can hydrate in a very slow manner uh, any living materials. Here you can see also clay extrusions with um, robotics, uh, so we're using clay as a material scaffold so that there is, um, uh, in a way, an idea of multi-performance and multi-graded um, uh, materials. We're working with the Center for Nature-Inspired Engineering at UCL as well. As you can see here, uh, we are trying to capture humidity and control airborne microbes in space architecture, so we're working with the European Space Agency. This is just starting. We're also growing new veneers um, through uh, microbial-induced silica precipitation, and this is to achieve a new sense of iridescence quality for architecture. Algae is obviously very important and of great relevance due to its uh, multiple applications. And for example, we are using it in combination with um, a new type of corkcrete medium. This is something we are developing with the University of Coimbra in, in Portugal, where they're experts in this. And we're using quite a few self-generative computational <laughs> models uh, in order to define the variance of the geometry and how these porous areas can uh, have a material absorption to enhance um, growth. Biophotovoltaics is of great interest to us. Uh, we have been working for a long time with Paolo Bombelli, who's a uh, world expert from Cambridge, 
in this field. We want to integrate them into buildings. Our aim is to design components that enhance the photosynthetic area of algae so that we can extract more electric current than currently is possible. So there's a carbon fiber network that uh, is inserted with a cathode and anode uh, in strategic points of, of these dishes. And then the algae is kept moist due to a hydrogel substrate uh, that feeds uh, the algae with nutrients. So the aim really of these dishes that we had at uh, the exhibition in the Pompidou was to create new systems for rooftops of buildings. Further area of great interest is bioremediation of water. Uh, you can see here micro, um, uh, microbial wastewater treatment is really important in areas of the world where pollution is diminishing the availability of potable water. So in these studies, um, uh, colleagues at biochemical engineering or in the biochemical labs are studying uh, the residence time of water and the heavy metal uptake. And we are now applying them onto tiles. And in a very recent move, uh, a, a student of ours, Shanil Malik, uh, with whom we were working, uh, developed these ceramic tiles in made in India. And we submitted them to the Water Designs Future here in New York and actually uh, won one of the categories and even the public vote, which was quite nice. Um, I mean, as you can see here, the, the venations allow really the runoff of water to be spread in a very even and slow way over the entire uh, wall surface. Lastly, bioreceptivity is something that we have been working on for a long time. Richard and I have been involved uh, for a long time on this. And um, cryptogums, mosses, uh, algae, and uh, lichens are of great interest. And these are panels that we made for the Santa Pompidou exhibition and two other smaller panels uh, that belong to a, another project are here in the show. So altogether, um, these few projects show that there's a variety of, to a variety of topics that we, we are keen on investigating. And for me personally, they are part of this idea of futures, um, the future of cities becoming photosynthetic. It means in other words, our, uh, our buildings need to move on to being these hard shelled carcasses to become such a something much more uh, soft and interactive. As you can see in these projects, there are lots of people involved. Interdisciplinary work always involves uh, dozens of people, so um, one is always grateful that um, there's this sort of shared knowledge. And um, that's all for me. Thank you. Sorry, this is my fault, this one, unfortunately. Where is it? Yeah, it's here. Can I get another one? Yeah, it's fine. Um, yeah, just to say as well, thank you very much uh, for inviting us uh, to talk here. Um, and again, in introduction, uh, Andrew mentioned that I had a, a previous background before I had studied architecture, which was in uh, more in biochemistry. Um, and I, I made a shift towards architecture because I felt that science just wasn't my long-term future. You know, I did, it for, I did it for sort of three or four years, was, was quite energetic about it at first, but it quickly became uh, something I realized wasn't going to be the long-term aim. So I, I made this shift to, to study architecture, which, which seems a long time ago now. <clears throat> it wasn't really until I came to the Bartley, actually, until, until I met Marcus, who was my tutor at the time, who actually made me aware that I could probably use this background that I had in, in, in architecture, the two things that I'd always seen as completely separate. And suddenly there's, there's this guy encouraging this kind of work. And so that really where my sort of journey began. And the, the bioreceptivity uh, projects that Marcus showed at the end, you know, we were lucky enough to work on that together. And really was, was the first kind of, it was quite a big step, I think, in the field of uh, moving away from the Petri dish. It was something we were always quite critical of when, when we first discussed this. For, for architecture, you can't stay in the Petri dish. You have to get out. And how do you do that? And I think that was that body of work was really a, a stepping stone for the, for the work that I'm going on to now. So I'm, I'm hugely grateful to Marcus for sort of bring, uh, making me into this field. Um, but my my talk is we use a lot of words which is, and tend to put bio in the front of it in, in this kind of uh, arena. But I think we we're all kind of ready for a new word other than bio. Um, bio augmented design. Um, I'm differentiating um, is, is a move actually to move away from from 
focusing purely on sustainability, which might be a funny time to be talking about that, seems how widespread the, uh, the, the agenda is at the moment. But there, there are other things that do relate to sustainability that we can focus on, and I, I think that biodesign, biofabrication, material-driven design, however you want to you wanna define your work, has, has, has an interesting role to play in this. <coughs> I'm just going to quickly go through um, a couple of projects that we run with RC7, which is um, uh, a course on the on the BPro Masters course at the Bartlett that actually Marcus and myself ran together for a few years, um, and I think it's a good place to start in into in showing to how sort of defining bio augmented design in that we can use living systems to augment uh, architecture in some way that again moves purely beyond uh, all those notions of sustainability. So the notion of the scaffold has become a very important thing, and so we're interested in how computational and generative scripts can become tool paths for fabrication, and how this can work on a scaffold for growth to happen. And so here we are seeing some more robotic work of, of these tool paths, printing a scaffold at, here at the architectural scale, and then at a much finer scale, which becomes the scaffold for the growth of species. Now in this case, the students were working with mycelium, which again is a material that's kind of become well known in the biodesign fields. It's very quick to grow and it has some interesting properties. But here we are testing the growth on the actual scaffolds. And so it's a cellulose based material um, that allows the mycelium to grow. And here the augmentation process is the mycelium growing within the structure to stabilize. And here's the student's final output of this, which was a table. And then moving on with it in terms of a similar approach this year, we, we're interested in how we can actually really start to integrate living cells into this and living species beyond purely just being a scaffold for growth. Could the growth actually start happening on that? And so we're looking at how we can, different ways of fabricating these kind of tool paths that come from uh, geometries, but using new approaches to 3D printing and fabrication using supported gel printing, which allows us, or it affords us to, to not have to worry about gravity and, and these usual things that we have to worry. And so this is a new type of cheating material that we've developed, which is able to grow cells on it and within it, but is also quite stiff. And it has the possibility to augment it with using bacteria that could bioluminesce as a visual thing or it could be something that uh, utilizes magnetic bacteria. I just actually have to go back to that slide. Oops, too quick. So the principle in, oh, it's gone on hold. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's this interesting principle down here that's used in medicine where they can actually start to target illnesses within the body through the use of magnetics. And so they can introduce drugs into the body and then they can use magnets to target the drugs to the specific area. So it's used a lot in the notions of tumors where they can actually target the cancer drugs directly to the tumor so it doesn't have to waste a lot of time elsewhere in the body where it's not necessarily doing anything. This was quite an interesting uh, idea for the project. Oh, goodness me, I'm sorry. <coughs> badly timed presentation. <laughs> yeah, so the idea is that could we actually, in, in a similar way, start to move uh, species and organisms around in a building to the areas they're needed? Because one question we've always had is, where, where should growth happen on a building? Where could it happen? And, and the answer really became that it would never be everywhere. So it might be needed, always needed to be in specific areas. And here's the students moving on to try this on an architectural scale here on a, on a very simple uh, geometrical arch. Um, but yeah, playing on this idea that you could have a species growing on the material and within the material that could be then targeted to specific points for structural or even just purely aesthetic uh, agendas. So that's that one. And then just to move on is uh, to introduce you to another project that I've been working on, which is uh, to do with the notion of health. Um, and I wonder actually if, um, could ask for a quick show of hands of, of people who have heard of the uh, human microbiome. Is that okay? Good. I wasn't sure if it had, it had come across, across in the same way. So it's a very interesting area that's, that's not really so new, but it's become quite common um, and widespread recently. But the point is, is that humans have a microbiome, and we're covered in bacterial cells and, and, and other things too. And 50% of us is actually described as not being human, right? It's 50% of our cells are actually bacterial. Um, but this has a huge implication for health, and we're starting to realize now that our current antibiotic lifestyle, 
which is often described as being too clean, but it's, it's, it's a more ingrained kind of cultural approach to just not accepting bacteria through this fear of them in our lifestyles. But we know very much now that the, the bacteria that exist in our gut uh, play a key role with our brain in terms of decision making, in terms of health, in terms of well-being. And so the medical field is starting to understand the benefit of bacteria, that not all bacteria are bad. In fact, many of them are good. But two, we have the indoor microbiome, and our buildings also have a microbiome. Uh, and it's called the indoor microbiome, it's called the built environment microbiome, um, but this directly relates to our health as well. And one problem we have is that by assuming that all bacteria are bad, um, we have no role for them in our buildings. And so what we tend to do in many of our uh, attempts at becoming sustainable, we tend to seal buildings off, we use a lot of mechanical ventilation, but what we're actually doing is removing ourselves from daily exposure to microbes, which is causing, causing huge problems for uh, autoimmune illness, but also antimicrobial resistance. And so we've been running a project to start to look into this uh, indoor microbiome. And here we're just doing some very simple uh, culturing, and this is actually the small kitchen area, which is just next to my office. Um, and these plates were out for 24 hours, and of course had some growth, and then we can take those back to the lab and we can start to look at what's there. And it's not surprising, you're, there's, there's loads. But there's, there's bacteria there, there's fungus there, there's probably viruses in there, there's protozoa in there. So it's nothing new that these exist, we know that. The problem is, is that in our buildings, we're not getting as many of the outdoor microbes as we need. And what we are being exposed to is predominantly human microbes, which are not always necessarily good. And when you have a microbiologist, who Sean, Sean there is the, is the guy working on this, he can look at a plate like that and very quickly get a sense of which ones are just nice environmental ones and which ones are potentially dangerous. And so the image on the right, where you use a different type of agar, you use a mannitol salt agar, and it tells you which ones are pathogens. And so everything that's turned yellow on that right side is a pathogen. So even, even in a kitchen area, in a, in a fairly new building that's quite clean, has a huge amount of microbes and actually has pathogenic microbes, some of which are Staphylococcus, which are antimicrobial resistance. They're called MRSA in the, in, in the UK. I don't know if it has a different term. But these are uh, antimicrobial resistant microbes that don't, don't respond to antibiotics. And this is a huge threat to our health. Um, as our current antibiotics are running out, we have to look at new ways to potentially be living in a post-antibiotic world. Now, one way we've been interested in looking to do this is to actually start to integrate good bacteria into our building materials. And that's quite a shift because we, we tend to not like bacteria on our materials in buildings. We tend to choose materials that are non-porous, that are very easily cleanable. And so here we're doing the opposite. We're going through a material tinkering stage um, and trying to develop alongside that a, a microbiological methodology of incorporating, in this case, it's a, it's a strain of bacillus um, that we know has antimicrobial activity against Staphylococcus. And so the images on the bottom right are sort of successful materials that we've manipulated in terms of their bioreceptivity to bacillus. And the bacillus are very happy to grow in there. They can survive in there for a long time. And when we put them back onto a plate, they grow again, which shows that they're viable. So we have this notion of a probiotic material. The image on the left there is an SEM microgar. There's all the bacillus in there. They're doing something called sporulation, which is when they go into a low metabolic state, uh, but they're still alive. And the image on the right, a tiny little image, but that is proof that this material can stop MRSA growing on it. So this notion of a probiotic architecture, which is related to health, still can relate to sustainability because I think health and well-being is part of a sustainable lifestyle, um, is, is an interesting area for us to look at. And so here we take, take it on beyond the Petri dish again, out of the lab, uh, and we proposed it as a set of tiles. Um, so there's four tile sets in the bottom there that give us variation and we can uh, put those together in lots of interesting ways. And this is where we're at with it. So it's, it's still quite early days with it. The image on the left there is a, a proposal for a, for a wall tile situation. And really I think where the future is going in is that we might start purposely growing bacteria in our buildings. Now we don't exactly know what good bacteria are and bad bacteria. Well, we know what bad ones are. We don't necessarily know what good ones are because what might be good for somebody might not necessarily be good for somebody else. But equally, there's options to put, potentially put vaccinations into our walls, another quite contentious topic. But the point is, I think there needs to be a paradigm shift. We need to understand that bacteria are nature, okay? We all see them as very separate, that bacteria are 
there. We've evolved with them over millions of years, and they're essential to our health. And so bioaugmented design and probiotic design is looking at new ways that we can integrate these species, these bacteria, into our buildings. Yeah, great. Thanks, you guys. You know, it, it was interesting because when we were doing a lot of the research for this exhibition, you know, I, I, I couldn't help but continue to consider how, of course, within modern design and a lot of design and architecture of the 20th century, growth itself was largely eschewed and was something that was kind of, you know, kept at bay, it was something that was not encouraged. <laughs> um, you know, we very much use often impervious materials, um, you know, concrete and metals and whatnot. And, and um, what's so interesting that we've found to be happening is really, again, this encouragement of growth and it's happening at so many different scales within textiles, within architecture itself. And, you know, so I wanted to start out just by asking you, why do you think this is important. Why is this happening? Well, I mean, <laughs> I th that's a, I'm trying to think how to it's like a start attacking that question. I mean, I th think it's important that we have the sort of paradigm that we've been through is about sort of, I mean, especially with uh, making textiles or other materials, is like the heat, beat, and treat. So take something from the earth, sort of heat it, apply pressure, you know, make things in, in that way. And we're now realizing that that's probably not the best for us or for the planet. So how do we think about ways that are, are more uh, in collaboration with living systems? And I think that's probably a big part of what's pushing that shift now to be more collaborative. Um, and it asks very different things of us as designers. You know, um, I've had, I, you know, working with uh, materials that are living that you can't disappear and, and leave off. I mean, when I learned textiles, I could have left my samples in the studio for weeks on end and come back and they'd have been exactly the same. And then you start working with things that are alive and it also encourages you to have a very different uh, relationship with what you make and how you make as well, which is fascinating. I think there is, um, there's for architects this famous uh, drawing that Le Corbusier in the 20th century did of the, um, you know, of this the sort of big tower and there's a, a balcony and they're looking out at sort of the distance and there's the green. So there was a real separation mm -hmm. and that was a bizarre contradiction because on the one hand, buildings on pilotis meant that he wanted to give more green space to people. But there, there was an inherent separation. It was great to look at, and nature was this thing there out there. We architects and the modern society was living in a completely different environment. And I think we clearly recognize that there was a real problem with that separation mm -hmm. uh, that we created, as Richard was mentioning, in the indoor health, um, a real problem, uh, and that the separation is killing what is around us and ourselves. So there's a real fascination in discovering that there is a, a totally new potential in what is growing. And if we start realizing that what we grow, we grow and design with that what we are growing, mm. we just enlarge the possibilities of what we can do uh, on so many fronts. And we are creating new materials, new systems in which we can physically make things um, that go beyond um, the problems we have with the current materials. Um, so I think I think that image is really quite interesting to go back and realize how much it affected us yeah. and how we how much still our environment is actually um, uh, inheriting that reality of that separation. So yeah, you know, and it's interesting. I mean, that definitely is something that that curatorially we very much were reflective on. Even when we started um, out with this idea of an exhibition on nature, how do you even define nature? And does that, is that inclusive of humans and of us? You know, and, and in many ways we started out almost thinking of it as this, this separation somehow, but no, we're all a part of it. <laughs> um, you know, and I think that we really are within the 21st century now embracing that and unfortunately seeing a part of the impact of you know, often thinking that it was something that's separate. You know, and it's in, so it's interesting actually, Richard, with you and so much of your work on 
this probiotic architecture, if you will, bio-augmented architecture, and really thinking about the microbiome of the interior and, and working with growth and bacteria that are at such a small, tiny scale, <laughs> and yet within architecture, which is at such a big scale. I mean, how do you kind of traverse these worlds, like, how, you know, and, and kind of bring all of it together and integrate it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, always, it's always been our challenge. I mean, uh, we've used the word interdisciplinary a few times, and I think the majority of this work has to start at, at the laboratory scale. It has to start in the Petri dish because it's, it's a notion of control. It's, it's something that's feasible to do. And in many cases, you, you, you work with the notion of the sterile in the laboratory. You're also faced with this thing then, as well as the scale, that when you come out of the laboratory, sterile doesn't exist. Nature abhors sterility, right? It, and the, and the, the monoculture, the, the single approach to one sphere, it doesn't exist because it's been discussed, we, uh, you know, you make one tiny change here, it affects four or five other, other things there. So as, as well as the scale, you've got this notion of something that you, you can work on in the lab and it, it kind of does its thing. I mean, a lot of designers describe how living species don't behave themselves, right? They always do something different. Well, mag magnify that by a thousand when you suddenly put that outside and it becomes part of the ecology, right? And uh, it's something that the, the only way you can do it is to test and that's why it's essential to actually for people involved in this is you have to get out of the laboratory actually. You can't spend all of your time in the laboratory because I, I'm not sure it means much for, for the larger scale. But um, just to add to that, I think um, there are two really interesting aspects. First of all, clearly the idea of sterility and again back to the modernists was so much part of this idea that we lived in a sterile environment and design was <coughs> aiming for a level of sterility and perfection and cleanliness. And I think we, we definitely went now uh, beyond that and recognized that there's a level of imperfection and unpredictability in design. Um, but the, the, the issue that is very difficult when the lab work is being scaled up is that we actually don't know how to scale up. It's tremendously difficult. A lot of the work can remain somehow in this sterile environment in a small scale. And once it gets outdoors or we want to make it bigger, the complexity of the problems, either to control it and or lose that control or simply not being able to know what's going to happen when it's bigger it are tremendous. And that's what I think the uh, architects and cities in general are, are not absorbing actually a lot of what is going on inside, for instance, such a museum like this one in this exhibition, which is a lot of small, interesting, amazing things. And then you get out onto the streets and you think, oh my God, there's a completely di different reality here. How, how is this adjusting to what we are doing? And it's not yet, because we don't know how to scale up things. It's really difficult. Um, now, you know, and I think actually that idea of control is something which is really interesting, right? I mean, can, can we ultimately control growth? of cells, of bacteria, of organisms, of algae? Is it, is it, you know, and to what extent, yeah, do we begin relinquishing some of that? Um, and, what and what is the aesthetic <laughs> then, and how is that impacted? I don't know if, Amy, you want to talk about that in your experience. Yeah, I mean, I think, and I talked a lot about making scaffolds and the idea of being able to control it. Yeah. I mean, to a certain extent, but no. <laughs> you can't really control it. It will do its own thing. You might change, something might change in the, when you're culturing it and it will it may do something different so i think you have to look at it more as uh that you're working with and i think there's a there's a the idea of trying to keep sterile or trying to keep nature out especially in things like you know architecture and built environment or anywhere is that no the human need for control or wanting to control things and that's a difficult thing to sort of uh, war against but you actually have to so maybe adjust the thinking uh, when you're when you're working with something that's living because it it may do something totally unexpected and that is something you have to almost you have to be prepared for um, and scale is a really interesting one I just wanted to touch on I think that's one of the things that as a designer when you first start living with le living working with living systems that you have to get used to is I mean my first question was like how big is a cell <laughs> like I can't see it so I don't know how big it is and I'm used to working with things that are one to one that I can understand you know I, I we were joking before the panel like, I work at this scale and these guys work at like building scale but you have it's a relation to yourself but once you start working with something that you can't see how do you even start trying to control a growth of something that, y that you can't see um, and I have an interesting sort of relationship because I can't um, get hands-on with the material that I'm working with in the lab because it doesn't have its own immune system. So working with things like animal cells, I have to work with it at arm's length. I have to use sterile tweezers and things like that. And as a textile designer, I'm used to getting hold of things and experiencing the material world through 
handling it, and and I can't do that. So it's it's al I've almost had the the uh, opposite uh, journey where I've sort of come from outside of the lab and being able to touch everything to going into the lab and not being able to touch anything, or I kill it. So, which is <laughs> which is fascinating. But that's all that idea of control. You're almost playing like the world's worst game of operation. And you have that one which buzzes if you touch. <laughs> it's like you know you're going to kill something if you get if you. And um, so it, it depends on what organism you're working with. I mean the that, the panels we have upstairs, when Richard and I started working on these bioreceptive uh, panels, the idea was really that we stop having control. And that is that we create a substrate that allows nature to do what it does well, which is to self-regulate, be in competition, sometimes die, yeah. sometimes be dormant, sometime, sometimes be alive. And we looked at tree barks at the time, and we thought, isn't this amazing that we, as architects, always talk about skins? Yeah when skin implies something very defensive, very protective, and barks do that, but they also host for an entire ecology that just adjusts mm -hmm. and is completely related to how the environment uh, triggers barks to be colonized by lots of microorganisms and, uh, and cryptogams. And we thought, if buildings do that, that will become much more interesting, but you can't really define how they're going to look like. Yeah. You can define some of the macro geometries, but, but what, nature then will do is going to be pretty unpredictable. Yeah. And against the idea of the green walls where you sort of have to have the pot with the type of plant that at some point will die and then you have to get a new pot and you have to maintain it, we just thought, let take, let's take the hands off and let this thing become what it is. Yeah. And that will be interesting. And we had then an exhibition at a fair in a fair in London and uh, we asked people who were around in this fair, and a pretty commercial fair, it was called uh, EcoBuild, um, do you know, what do they think if they would be having panels on their houses or buildings and sometimes nothing would be growing? And it was fascinating how people were op actually open to that idea. I said, well, that's what happens around us. Sometimes <laughs> things die off. That's fine. It's no, we don't have to have a golf course mentality all the time. And so I think there is a shift going on already that people accept that it doesn't have to be all the time green and, and, and looking pretty. Yeah. It can at times also look quite different and that's fine. It's that perception of nature. I mean, it's something we discuss so much when we're doing it. Na nature is not green. I mean, it's, it's everybody talks about greenwash, but we all do have this preconception of nature being the lush green condition, and and it's not. It's it's different everywhere in the world. It's cyclical. It changes. I mean, one one thing in, in going back to the, the comment of control, and and although although we were accepting that nature is going to do its thing, the notion of control was always we we drew an a, an analogy with the garden in that if you let a garden just grow, it becomes overgrown and, and it looks untidy and we don't like that. And that's different from a meadow, which is a meadow is not tended to, but it has a, a level of control that's that's achieved through the ecology. And and where do you stand on that as a, as a designer? Because it's tough, because if, if something looks out of control and unkempt, pe people don't like it. It becomes even worse when you're comparing, you know, people tend to like green species and things. When you're talking about bacteria and things that might grow a bit yellow and a bit kind of ugly looking, that then the worst case is that that looks completely out of control. People f would be fearful of that and trust it. So yeah. I, I do believe there is there is actually a need for a level of control, but it's it's definitely not the top down approach to, to to design that we've we've done before. It's it's about understanding yeah. how the species works, what it needs, and then uh, allowing it to to thrive in in a, in a in an environment. You know, and perhaps a part of that too is a level of expectation and a changing relationship with nature and what you expect either as a consumer or someone living within a space or having a home and being okay with, you know, panels that are not seeded or not green or, you know, thinking about a nature that is self-regulatory, <laughs> if you will. Um, you know, and, and I think so much of even what, what we're talking about um, is incredibly reflective of a changing relationship that all of us are having um, with nature and with design and with possibility. Well, there is this um, sense we have of nature uh, where we see nature as a, as a photograph, as something that seems to be static, and we all know it's not. And there's this very interesting book uh, written by this uh, English evolutionary biologist called uh, The Inheritors of the Earth, where he says, this is a long, very slow m motion film. And in this film, nature is evolving and changing. And evolution doesn't mean for better or worse, it's just changing. And currently, we are changing it massively, and we are changing with it, and it's changing us. 
and um, a lot of what we are producing is starting to create another nature, but it's, it's just nature. Yeah. So we are part of it, it's, there's no distinction. So that distinction that before existed, it's sort of rather absurd. Um, so it's quite interesting to imagine that these species are mutating. We are helping them to mutate, but they were mutating anyway in their own right. And that creates really interesting discussions about how the world of microbes is changing and mutating because of our internal environments that we are creating. Yeah. Um, or, you know, the piece of, there was a sort of piece of stone that came from uh, in the previous presentations uh, that was the result of some nuclear tests. Yeah. It means things that were never there before, but now they are part of mm -hmm. what we consider nature. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is part of that sort of level of mm -hmm. slow evolution or change mm -hmm. means that we don't have a control over it anyway. Right. It's, uh, right. That's what it is. Right. You know, and it's interesting, too, that you actually bring up this idea of, you know, of, of slow evolution. You know, Richard and I were actually just even discussing yesterday. I'm, I'm, you know, sort of endlessly fascinated about that hypothesis of, of Earth being an organism, Gaia. You know, which was um, came out in, in the 70s or so, and you know that in many ways you talk about scale. I mean, of course, there's you know, kind of, you know, the the one scale, um, you know, with kind of like the three dimensions. But you think about time as another scale, <laughs> and you know, if you think about the Earth itself being its own organism and moving at this unbelievably slow scale, but here we are. <laughs> moving at such a different scale and speed. Um, and, you know, I think about all of your work in working with um, in growth and, and cells and bacteria. I mean, you know, ha like, how do you deal with time scales even then of creating work? <laughs> because you're, you're also very beholden to completely, completely different time scales. So if you want to comment on that. No, absolutely. I think it's something that you can't predict. I mean, you know, it's it's fascinating. I think I will come back to the, the time scale, but just the, the the idea of systems. And there's an, a, an amazing book, and the the author is escaping, but it's called the Systems View of Life. And just thinking about growing that nothing grows in in or nothing exists often in isolation. And and when you're working with tissue culture, a lot of people work with one cell type. Mm -hmm. That no, there's no place in the body that there's only one cell type. Everything is interfacing with everything else. So when you work in a petri dish, that's almost like the idea for tissue engineering to get out of the petri dish is to not just grow skin cells, you know, to, but to grow it in connection next to, to bone cells or to muscle or to cartilage, just thinking about how everything interfaces and having a less of a sort of um, a regimented, maybe almost engineering approach of trying to break everything down to its smallest consistent part, but actually thinking about how does everything work together. And one of those aspects is is definitely time. Um, you you have to the sort of time points that, you, especially with tissue culture, when you work with that, um, it can be hours, days, months, depending on what you're working with and what you're trying to achieve. So that sort of gives you a different perspective. And even just the research itself, as a designer who's used to working on quick, fast projects, where you maybe have a turnaround in, you know, you could be working on a week project. Here you're looking at years' worth of research and your idea of what it takes to bring something to fruition and the time that that takes shifts. There's a, a, a patience that you have to sort of, I think, practice where you want to see things happen faster and you, you can't, you can't make it grow faster. You just have to accept that it will take the time it needs yeah. and you have to work with that as one of your parameters. Yeah. I think it's important that as... Hello? Yeah. I think it's important as, as, as a designer that you, you have to make, uh, at various points, you have to make quick leaps and it's something that the scientists can't do. And we talk about, always talk about the species being very slow, but microbiologists are like, even slower, aren't they? <laughs> because they work in a different way because they're, they're following science methodologies. And I think it's important that when, when you're designing with this kind of stuff, you, you, you have to remember you are a designer and you're not just doing it. You're not a scientist, right? You're, you're borrowing a few scientific methodologies, but we have the freedom to make leaps. And, and that's how I, I see you have this kind of slow building project that's, uh, that's underpinned with scientific methodology. So you have a, a, a level of rigor and a, a level of repeatability that, that's needed for this kind of work. But as a, as a designer, you, you have to make leaps. And actually, that's where exhibitions come in very well, because it gives you a deadline. And you think, <laughs> oh my god, I have to make something for this exhibition. And we, we always talk about our pieces that end up in exhibitions, and they're never quite the pieces you, you want them to be because of this thing, right? At some point, you just have to say, right, what am I actually now going to design? Because if you constantly play in the scientist, you, you never design anything. So at this point, I'm going to open it up to uh, questions from our audience.
if you have a question, raise your hand high. Yes, so, and if you'll wait for the microphone to be passed to you. Thank you. I think there may, may be something of a gap in your thinking, and that is um, understanding more about the, particularly the urban environments that you're going to be building in. The whole smart city movement is one in which cities are understanding far more and getting much more data about the urban environment. Maybe some of the things you're talking about would succeed better if you knew more about that or connected more with the Internet of Things. Uh, in Chicago, we have something called the Array of Things. The whole, you know, hundreds of sensors are being put in the center of the city and on university campuses to measure and record all kinds of data, temperature, the passage of vehicles, uh, level of pollutants, and so on. Maybe to forge a relationship between what you're doing and the Internet of Things might be very interesting. Yeah, I, I'm completely on board with that too. I mean, the, the, the starting point, I think, for our bioreceptivity work that, that we did together was, was actually a criticism of the existing condition of the Green Wall, um, which, you know, if you look in academia, you, you, you see images of cities that are green everywhere. The reality is our cities are not very green, the, and the, the real condition was the Green Wall, and the problem is that they've been hugely expensive. And so that was our starting point. Could we come up with a way that was much cheaper, didn't need this technical irrigation system embracing nature that way? But having said that, that doesn't mean we're technophobes and not interested in doing it and, I, and I, I, I do think it actually it would be very important because the, the way that we can feed data into this and with, with the advent of technologies I mean we I, I know Marcus very well and we're, we're, we're both very interested in technology it's just that I think that was the starting point for the work and I think that as we we have to try and get this into cities first and then start to think about the technology side of it afterwards well, and actually, I do have to just point out quickly when we were talking just before this panel, you know, one thing that Marcus, you pointed out was, you know, what we really actually need is almost like a role model of a building, <laughs> even, you know, to think about what, you know, how that could potentially integrate into that type of, you know, an environment with fed I, by data. Uh, I would add to that that obviously there is a lot of technology available. Yeah. Um, but there is an inherent problem, I think, that a lot of this technology has been added to buildings, mm -hmm. uh, but it hasn't really changed how we design them really. Mm -hmm. And the aesthetics of the buildings, the way we use them hasn't really changed. And that means that I think there's a lot of technology to monitor our environment and see what it does, etc. but our buildings are not really as responsive as we imagined. And they, they end up often, and again, back to the green walls, what we didn't like was the fact that the sort of actually pseudo-modernist buildings with green facades glued onto them. And it, it was like a collage system, and there was something very awkward about this. Yeah. And you think, well, if we can really grow our buildings, then we will design them differently. They, we will occupy the space and experience it in a different way, and we need still to rethink that yeah. somehow from scratch. What we can't do is to design buildings and cities in the same way as we have done and add a lot of bits of technology to it because it's like ha having an ugly building with some very good piece of um, aircon, but then after a few years we realize that there's some even better piece of aircon, and, and then at some point we want passive cooling and get rid of it, but it's still the same building. <laughs> and I think there is an evolution where we need to really rethink much more from scratch in a much more profound and holistic way how we design and how we experience these new, this new building fabric of our city. I see a question back here. Hi, um, it's actually a bit, bit carrying on what you mentioned, Mar Marcus, and like what has been met, um, hinted throughout the panel is that I, when it comes to working with students and young academics and n new young, new young up and coming designers and artists, how, what have you seen has been the challenges in getting them to be willing to tinker and experiment with scientific elements, scientific and mathematical elements, because. Or do you feel that they have en they're entering the field already open-minded in wanting to experiment? Because you're saying that there needs to be evolutions and changes in how we design, how we how and how we create. But thing is that that would require a complete change in methodology and teaching in the first place. Well, in fact, we created this two-year master's course <laughs> out of the necess necessity that one year was too short, and. Um, and um, we are quite surprised of how many people are actually really increasingly interested in this hybrid field and um, how they're being open-minded to be challenged to work in different uh, spaces, being in the lab, being in a, in a traditional workshop or being in a design studio. And it's hopefully going to breed a new 
a new group of thinkers, of practitioners, of designers that actually have a completely different sensibility and understanding in a very intuitive way. I think in our case, our intuition was formed in a very traditional way, but we are fascinated with the possibilities of something new. Whereas hopefully this new generation is actually starting to become completely different in, in the way they think, and they will find it really awkward how we still, in the top-down manner, sketch something out and have, maybe there's a different rationale. And, and I think these work methodologies are gradually evolving, and they're evolving in, the dis, in this interdisciplinary way where the collaboration is not only in the traditional way where somebody has an expertise, the other one has an expertise, and the other one, it's actually there's far more hybridity of people who have multiple bits of expertise. And I think that's where it's becoming really interesting. In, in our field, I mean, the, the question we always used to get when, when students arrived was, which, which software are we using? Where's, where's the, the, the labs with the computers? Sorry, not the labs, where's the, where's the computer? Which, what do we do? And now the questions are changing, and students are asking, where, where's the lab? What, what, what lab equipment do we have? Who, who, do, who do we know in, in UCL that can help me with this type of thing? So it, the, the culture is definitely, definitely changing. No, I mean, I would echo all that's been said. I think it's up until now, it, it is changing, but there aren't that many courses where you can go and, and learn it. I think with a lot of us, I mean, myself certainly, I sort of constructed my own sort of educational path where I sort of kept following what I was interested in, but I had to seek out where I could go and learn different things. I think there are courses, like, you know, very much like the, the one that uh, Richard and, and, and Marcus run, where you can, you can do that, and there are labs that are starting to be integrated into universities, which is fantastic. I think, I know definitely in, in the UK, in the education system is set up as such that it's very siloed and that you're often told from a very young age you're either scientific or creative and that somehow the two are mutually exclusive, which is absolutely not the case. Um, it's a cliche, but if you said that to Leonardo da Vinci, he probably he would laugh at you. Um, but th but there is, so there is something there, but I think it's also important to say that you don't want to become a scientist. Like I am not a tissue engineer. There are lots of people with PhDs in that who are fantastic at it. I want to know enough so I can have a conversation, but to start that kind of, that, that collaboration. And I do think it's a methodology and a way of working. I think you can teach students to work um, and you have to work in a way, you don't necessarily even need to work with the organism. It's about understanding materials. It's about being able to structure experiments and about being inquisitive and, and working with materials or approaching a problem in a certain way, um, which then can be transferred to any different, you know, multiple different technologies, but it is a way of working and a way of being curious about the world and the materials that we use and the way we make things, and maybe moving away from that top-down approach to something that maybe is more bottom-up, where you sort of want to see what you can build by understanding multiple different things. Did you have something else? No, I, I, I had the other day an experience with a student which really fascinated me. We, um, we were in, in the laboratory. We were using some hydrogels, and the problem with hydrogels is you can't really three-dimensionalize them. They sag, and they have, they have weight, and they have a viscosity. And uh, we did a field trip to Barcelona where we presented some work. And the student came back and thought about the Gaudi experiments with catenaries mm -hmm. and started producing catenaries with hydrogels. Mm -hmm. And there was this lady in the lab producing in an, in an inverted manner these extrusions of hydrogel mm -hmm. and then turned them around. And I looked at it and I thought, this is a new type of thinker. She's actually combining structural thinking with spatial thinking, with material thinking, I inside a laboratory. <laughs> and I can imagine her on the robot in the next few weeks already starting to do that. And I think that is the way forward, absolutely. She's finding a new solution how to do this. And I think in traditional ways, you would stick sort of to the bits of the lab limitations that you have and somehow only remain there. Yeah, I love that. So we have time for one more question. Sorry, yeah, back here. Hi. Um, I work in the drawings and prints department here, and so a lot of my time is spent thinking about keeping art and storage areas dry and um, cold. Uh, and so I was also thinking, I was overhearing some of the curators as they were installing the show talk about how the materials that might be more like environmentally friendly are not as friendly to the collections object. And that was a sort of push and pull that they were going through. And I was thinking about architecture and um, microbiology as you guys are speaking and wondering if you can think of um, targeting applications of this type of uh, interior microbiome in a way that would control an environment for art and collections objects since we are sitting in a museum um, and sort of what the applications of that might look like. 
<laughs> Good question. Just got yourself a first commission for the. I don't, know yeah. if I, can I don't know if I can answer it now, but yeah. I, I, look, I think a starting point. I mean, it's an interesting concept as a, as a way to start yeah. thinking about something, right? I mean, it's you know, we unfortunately couldn't have living moss on our panels here yeah. because of because of that reason, which is right. a shame. But I, I maybe can. Um, to find some uh, answer. Actually, the, the, the project I very, very briefly mentioned that the um, European Space Agency is so interested in, in starting to help us to develop is about uh, nanoprinting of very, very small scale um, surfaces in which humidity can be absorbed and then retained. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems they have, we have with a space um, station is that uh, to transport water is tremendously expensive. So there's a loss of 7% seven uh, 7 of water, and this costs millions. And therefore, if there's a full cycle of recycling water, it means humidity in spaces is a real issue that then develops microbes, etc., cetera, and, and, and growth. So um, if actually we are able to, in a passive way, uh, and, 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 and through the learnings of models in nature, how some of the lizards and some of our species have actually this capacity to absorb through their surface geometry uh, small, tiny amounts of water and humidity from the air. Um, and that's why the nature inspired and the uh, biointegrated, I think, go hand in hand. If we start doing that, maybe our surfaces have a sort of veneering that can tackle some of these issues. And it's partly a filtering system, partly an absorption system and retention system that might help to control the environment. Just uh, maybe you can help me with a reference. Was there a case of a library somewhere that has bats in it and the bats help to keep the, the books dry? Did you hear this? Yes, one? this is this library from the Enlightenment period in, in uh, outside Lisbon in Portugal where they have the bats that keep the, uh, um, the worms out of the books. And this ancient library, this absolutely phenomenal, beautiful building, at night has these gates and the bats come in and they never have a problem with uh, worms and and and, uh, and lices and all sorts of other animals in their books in their ancient books so um, here we go some get some bats that is yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> on that note i don't know that cooper hewitt will be getting a bat <laughs> brigade to protect our, our objects but um but thank you so much to our panelists and to all of you um for joining us and we invite you to continue the conversation uh, after the panel and we have another one following up at 6:45 on nature as architecture so thank you